I'm Virginia Eskin. When I was growing up in San Diego, I would go with my family to Balboa Park, and we'd listen to the outdoor organ. Then we'd go to a ball game, and we'd hear the organ again. I begged my father for organ lessons, and he agreed. So every Saturday morning, we'd trip down to the Orpheum Theater. It was a lot of fun. Well, today, we'll investigate the king of instruments on a note to you. To lead us on our investigation, I've enlisted a qualified guide, Boston keyboard artist Joseph Payne. He's an organist, harpsichordist, he does practical research, and he performs in a historically informed way. What does that mean exactly, Joe? Oh, it means that I read books before I do my playing and things like that. No, it sounds it sounds horribly stuffy, but really it isn't. It means that one brings to bear on a performance a certain historical perspective and a, a view of the musical instrument or the repertoire within the context of history. I think that's the simplest way. Were of you always it. interested in history as a boy? Yes, yes, oddly enough. Uh, and it's normal that I should gravitate towards uh, instruments such as the harpsichord and the clavichord and the organ rather than the piano simply because these are instruments that within the present scheme of things uh, one views very much from the perspective of history. Well, let's So to clarify, what is a pipe organ? Well, a pipe organ, as opposed to, I suppose, other sorts of organs, which um, don't really concern us today, uh, is basically a collection of pipes that are made to sound primarily through the use of a keyboard. And uh, these are instruments that can range in size uh, from just a few hundred pipes to many, many, many thousands of pipes. And the largest, for instance, pipe organ in the world, which is an instrument in Atlantic City, has uh, over, I think, 30,000 pipes. Um, And one of the smallest but most loveliest organs that I've ever played, on the other hand, is a a little organ in uh, the town of Ordruf, where Johann Sebastian Bach spent time as a 10-year-old. And it's an organ that he used to practice on as a child. So that's fascinating. You've concerned yourself then with the the sort of 300-year period from the very beginning of organ sound, 1300? Around 13, yes, around even before that. But I'm talking about mainly the repertoire, the music that was specifically written for the, for the organ. Uh, one can date safely to about 1350 or thereabouts. And you have to remember, of course, that the organ uh, is the only instrument, keyboard instrument, that is, uh, which spans, you know, a seven 800 year period of, uh, of, of existence. It's never gone out of popularity. It's never gone out of, well, it's not never gone out of use. It may have eclipsed itself here and there. But unlike the harpsichord or the piano, which have relatively short histories, uh, the organ really has, spans the whole gamut of music, of Western musical history. Well, let's hear a little bit of sort of early music. Let's hear a recording you've made on an um, instrument that lives here in Brookline, Mass. This is a Bach work.
We just heard the prelude of the Credo, taken from a mass, and the second work was O Lamb of God, both short pieces by Bach. And my guest today is Joseph Payne, a wonderful organist, and he's going to illuminate us on what makes an organ, how they function, and everything we wanted to ever know about the organ. We're going to ask you. What was the earliest pipe organ? Well, uh, this is an interesting thing, of course, the pipe organ, which has such a long history. And the, the two examples that we just heard, incidentally, would be representative of instruments in the middle of its period of development, roughly around 18th century. But going back, way back to, let's say, the 13th or 14th century, uh, you'd have an instrument that was made to sound in exactly the same way. Uh, you'd have basically a pipe, a um, pipe, that was made of one of two ways, either as a a flue-type uh, affair mm -hmm. or as a reed-type affair. It was a pipe in which which resembled the oboe, for instance, where there was a, a reed across uh, its mouth, and when the air went by it, of course, it forced it to vibrate. And this is something that uh, extends throughout the entire period of the organ's history and is as common at the beginning as it is at the end. It is presumed, actually, that the earliest organs may have been, that we know of, may have been in Britain, of all places. And the, the oldest organs that we know about, that in which there is extensive documentation, were instruments, for instance, in Winchester Cathedral and also in places like Halberstadt Cathedral. In, uh, but going further back than that into antiquity, of course, you have the famous water organs, uh, which the Romans used. And there are uh, there's evidence of this, which has been found in places like, uh, like Hungary. Rather than being powered by air, they were powered by water. And, of course, that's your steam organ, which yeah. still exists in, in its Shades of circus. Shades of Ben Franklin's exactly. class the, harmonica, yes, which yes, also indeed. is... So all of, the, all of the various elements of the universe uh, are sort of endowed in this very mystical instrument, which uh, has a fascinating history. And, and it makes you feel better somehow when you hear an organ. It's this kind of a settling quality. Well, those are, all, of course, all the psycho, <laughs> psychological factors that work for and against it. For instance, uh, I talked to somebody who said, I hate organ music. And I said, why? Well, it reminds me of funerals. And, of course, this is the experience, the extent of the experience that a lot of people have. They're giving themselves away. I think so. <laughs> they should have gone to more baseball games. <laughs> well, as organs evolved, then composers kept track with the evolution of the manufacture? Yes, it becomes a chicken-egg sort of situation. The, the composers of organ music uh, demanded certain sounds from an instrument, so the people who built them went out and tried to do their best uh, to accommodate the composers. Or the inventive builders would find new sounds and challenge the composers with them. That's always um, a nice... And this is always, this is, the, of course, the history of musical instruments. Right. You know. The synthesis yes. of... Yeah. Well, let's listen to another of your recordings. This is Puckabell, and we were just going to play the Toccata, and then we happened to listen to the Fugue, and we decided they are delicious, so we're going to play both of them. The Toccata and Fugue in C, played by Joseph Payne.
That was Pakel Bell, Takara and Fugue, in C major, played by our guest, Joseph Payne. And you were waxing mellow about this instrument. Oh, I love this instrument. It's one of my favorite instruments. It's an extremely important instrument because it was presided over by a composer named Johann Ludwig Krebs, whose word, name in English means crab. And they used to say of Krebs that he was the biggest crab in the brook, that is to say, <laughs> the biggest crab in the Bach, uh, because he was a pupil of Bach's. And Bach was the one who came down from Leipzig uh, in the later years of his life, and he tested out this organ when it was first built. And oh, so it really, has a real stamp of, of approval. It's really a magnificent instrument. I first played it in 1979 when I first went into eastern Germany when it was not such a hospitable place. And, of course, the organ was not in as good a shape as it is now. And uh, the marvelous thing about visiting and playing organs in this region of the world, that is to say Bach country, um, is that it now it's, it's so thoroughly accessible when, of course, it wasn't. And to see these wonderful historic instruments being built and restored and being played upon... Uh, Do you only find that in Germany? Well, of course, this is Bach in his lifetime only stayed in, in one very small area of the world. He never went, to, went out of the country. And the longest he ever went was from, uh, uh, from Thuringia in the central Germany up to the Hanseatic port of, of Hamburg. Uh, and other than that, he, he never traveled. So I'm thinking of you creeping around all these organ lofts uh, that must be cold as uh, a witch's you-know-what. You know, uh, yes, it is indeed, bring, as, as a witch's you-know-what. But climbing up the staircases that were once trodden by people like Bach and Buxtehude is a wonderfully invigorating feeling, even on a very cold night. And, of course, incidentally, in the days when they used to have to play and practice on these instruments, um, you wonder how they did it, you know, in the cold weather, cold winters that they had. Because we were talking and, before, how did Bach get the air power into the uh, pipes? He had Well, he had a fellow who kept himself very warm by, uh -huh. by pumping with their feet and their legs. And, of course, they got a great deal of exercise that way and kept themselves warm. Uh, at and Bach sun. probably wore mitts on and his hands perhaps. at that level. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what they did is they had practice instruments in their home. That's what they did to keep themselves from It must freezing. have been mind-blowing when you think of the sound of a clavichord, which is so delicate, or a harpsichord, or those instruments that people took you know, in a castle. It had no legs. It was sort of a movable keyboard. Yes. And then all of a sudden, the sound of an organ with all the overtones, people must have fallen away in a dead faint. Well, they did. It was the loudest sound known to man. And uh, a colleague of mine made the remark, uh, for instance, in, in Hamburg, there's a very, very famous organ that was built by a famous builder who was known to Bach by the name of Arp Schnitke. And he built what was then one of the largest organs ever built in Europe. And my colleague remarked to me, they said, you know, the, the, the feat, the accomplishment of building this instrument at that time was the equivalent of sending, of our sending a man to the moon. I believe it. It was a, the amalgamation of art and will I was with thinking technology, of Da Vinci you know? strapping wings on his back, yes. you know, and, and emulating a bird. That's right. The same mindset. Yes. Well, let's go to this CD that you've brought in. And it's intriguing. I like the title, Bach Book. Yes, a Bach book. Every organist in those days had their little workbooks, in other words, their collections of pieces that, that they had hand-copied, mind you, and this became their working repertoire. Like a tune dex. They, yes, they took their, or fake books if you're a jazz musician, right. and they took their books to work with them, and uh, if it was a funeral, they, they turned to the, the, the place in the book where they had funeral music and uh, chose one idea. of their pieces. And, and, and that's basically what this collection is. And the piece that we'll listen to is a little piece uh, that's played on an organ which Johann Sebastian Bach played when he was 10 years old. And this is an instrument that he, he practiced on as a boy. And it's in a little chapel in the town of Ordruf in Germany where he went to live when his parents died and um, where his older brother, Johann Christoph, lived and worked. And this is a little notebook which was kept in the family, and it was used uh, by various members of the family as, as a little workbook. Where does that live now? Now, at this point in time, of course, it's all it's in, in, the, in the main repository of manuscripts in Berlin, which, of course, it's, it's all these manuscripts have become centralized in the last few years. Well, let's hear the gavotte. 
by Pestel, Pestel. from the Andreas Bach book. My guest, Joseph Payne, who's enlightening us about organs, organ music, organ manufacturer, and that was a little gavotte by Pastel. Now, you performed on all manner of organs, Joe, throughout Europe, and we've talked about some of the difficulties upon meeting these beasts on their terms. (laughs) Do you prefer to play older instruments to modern ones? Yes, I do, because I think no matter how good the the new ones are, and there's some, you know, very, very wonderful instruments made by modern builders, don't get me wrong, there's something very special about an experience when when you're playing the instrument that the composer himself played. And they haven't changed the keys, you're telling me? And many of them aren't changed at all. Of course, this is always a question of degree. Some of them are restored so thoroughly that you wouldn't know what the original state was. But organs are so complicated and complex, for instance, the pipework will usually contain at least, let's say, at least 60% of the original pipes. And you have to remember in places like Germany, of course, a lot of the pipes were given up for the war effort. uh, The metal in them. And the metal in them was melted down. For instance, the large instruments, uh, lead and and, uh, iron. Uh, oh, they resonate. I wouldn't think iron would resonate. Well, enough. it was thrown in with whatever they they made they smelted. made bombs out of. You see, and and uh, this particular instrument um, that we're going to hear in Altenburg was uh, the case pipes were given up for that effort. So those those part, that part of the organ will be new, of course. Well, let's let's go back to Pachel Bell and listen to some fugues. On, I think it sounds like it's, this is your favorite organ. Yes, it is. Well, one of them. One of, I, I think it's one of my Desert Isle organs. Do you think of organs as a she or he? Or are they just... I think of it, everything in life is a, that's worth spending any time with, I suppose, as a she. <laughs> <laughs> well, like countries. Russia's a she. Yes, the ships are she's, right. aren't they? And All right. I think organs are she's too, yes. All right. Well, let's hear it.
Those were just two little fugues on the Magnificat by Paquel Bell. And you said that he wrote about 95 of those? Yes, he wrote 95. None of them much longer than two minutes. And what was their use? Their use was probably purely a functional piece of what's called in the liturgical musical trade traveling music. In other words, a little piece of diddly music that would get the priests from one part of the altar to the Ah. other part. And probably nothing more than that. Like a soundtrack. Like a soundtrack, yes. And could you, what is a register? A register is a, is a, a set of pipes that have a particular quality of, of sounds and are voiced a certain way. Kind of so woofy or singy. Woody, woofy or, or singy or tweety or, you know, whatever character is imbued on them. The flavor kind yes. of, of the sound. Uh, and it's a complete set. In other words, it goes from the lowest note of the keyboard, so to speak, uh, generally, to the highest note of the keyboard. And so an organ size is generally thought of as being such and such a number of registers or stops. It's used interchangeably because this tells you how many voices there are in the organ. It doesn't tell you how loud the instrument is. And in then other, a manual. A manual those is the are keyboard. The... That's the keyboard from which the stops are operated. In other words, made to, made to sound. Uh, an organ can have anywhere from, let's say, one stop or two or three, at the, the smallest instruments, all the way up to over 300 stops, which is the largest organ in the world. And uh, Plus you have to uh, educate your feet. I remember that was the hard part for me. And they're, play, they're played by, you know, two hands and occasionally the nose and, and two <laughs> feet. <laughs> Do you wear special organ shoes? One can. Uh, depends on how the pedal keyboard is made, the pedal board, you whether or not they're... soft... They're, uh, sole shoes, so you can sort of you slide yeah. uh, you slide feet to toe. But now we're getting into a television show, you see. Well, let's go to one of your more recent recordings of the Dublin Virginal Manuscript. So it's to me that's going to be Irish. Now read... we're talking about where 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 we're jumping now into the 16th century uh, in England. Actually, this particular collection of pieces. There again, all these books and manuscripts. They were. They were collections of music, either by one composer or several, but always in, usually in, in, copied by one person. And we don't know for sure who the copyist of this particular piece is, but we call it the Dublin Manuscript simply because that's where the manuscript is Today. currently and where ah. it was brought. It was brought from Westminster School in London, brought over there by a, a, an Anglican bishop a man by the name of Bishop Usher. And for those of you who know the Irish history well, you will know that Bishop Usher was the man who tried to date the history of the world. And he arrived at the magical figure of 5,000 years. Hmm. And he was a, a compulsive bibliophile, and he brought manuscripts of music, and uh, mainly to build up the library of Trinity College Dublin. And that is where the manuscript is today. His compulsion is our benefit. Very much so. And the writing down of music uh, corresponds to the publication of books, because in a historical sense, by now books are readily available. In the Renaissance, they weren't. Only well-to-do people own books. Yes. But by the Baroque period or... Uh, Certainly this time in England, uh, books are still... There are enough books around so that people could own many, many of them. And, of course, they could feed their particular compulsions that way. Right, and people could learn music because if you don't have something to read, then you're just navigating without a a chart. By this period, roughly around uh, around 1600s, music printing had only been around for about less than 100 years. I mean, you have the idea of movable type in music was still comparatively young. Mm -hmm. But at least it did allow the dissemination of music and people didn't have to copy things by hand over and over and over again. Or train like in a guild at the foot of a master. Exactly, um, There's more travel. The world is opening up. It's not the age of enlightenment, but we're getting there. And I I love uh, listening to this recording of yours, Joe, the magic of the pavan, because you you uh, put them in all kinds of interesting order. To me, a pavan was a dance, but when I listen to your pavans, they're they're very intellectual. It's a very slow dance, but then, of course, dances, as they became rarefied, they became undanceable, so to speak. And the pavan, allemands, courants, all of these dances, by the time they become used as keyboard forms, 
uh, they are far removed from the realm of the dance, it, it, literally speaking. And the, the Pavan, of course, was uh, uh, were written by composers during the Elizabethan period mainly um, to flatter uh, various uh, noble personages. So you have things such as the Earl of Salisbury's Pavan and the Lord Lumley's Pavan and so forth. The Earl of Sandwich. And the Earl of... While he's eating his sandwich. While he's eating his sandwich, we're listening to his <laughs> Pavan. There you are. <laughs> well, let's listen to your Pavan. <laughs> Master Taylor, it's called. Here's Joe Payne playing it. was Joe Payne playing a pavan and a galliard from the Dublin manuscript. And I liked that second bit. I heard F natural in the key of G. Well, that's the mode. <laughs> I liked it, though. It's like a little lemon juice. All of a sudden, a little, yeah. bit, of, a little bit of lemon juice. A little flavoring there. <laughs> that's that's a, an unusually beautiful instrument, which dates from 1531, which uh, is to be found in a small village in the, in the northern Netherlands. I'm laughing. I'm thinking, here you are, this attractive man, and you're salivating as you talk about these instruments. Other men keep little <laughs> black books with women's <laughs> phone numbers, and you you have all these mistresses, these organs in various countries that you get to visit and touch them. Yes, they're my mistresses. Oh, it's, it's dear. <laughs> I'm Virginia Eskin, and we're having a look at the king of instruments today with my guest, Boston keyboard artist Joseph Payne. If you have comments, write us. The address is a note to you, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. Well, now we're going to jump <laughs> into another realm, Head Joe. Along. We're going to go to the 20th mm-hmm. century, just for a little contrast. And there you are sitting uh, at your dear little organs. Are they comfortable at least, the seats that you get to sit on? Or? The benches are always the same, and they have been. The benches never change. They're just hard boards. 
So do you take a little pillow? We take a little pillow usually or a little something which helps us actually to slide. What's that made of? Special cloth? A little piece of cloth or a little... little, Sort of like the thing that violinists put under their neck. Precisely. A little little, little sort of... uh, What was that that character in Peanuts always had a cloth? The Linus had his... um, His banky. His blanket, yes. And my son had one when he was... Pavarotti has a filthy handkerchief that he can only sing (laughs) with, apparently. Something that you carry along with you. Right. In my case, my wife sewed me one, a very pretty one, which always accompanies me. Well, I don't know if this organist has one, but I'd like our listeners to hear one of the, it's supposed to be one of the great organs of the world. It lives in Los Angeles at the Congregational Church. Oh, yes. And this is um, a piece by Sir William Walton, Coronation March mm-hmm. from the Orb and Scepter. Mm-hmm. And it's played by David Briggs. Um, Wonderful fellow, yes. Do you organist. know him? Oh, yes, very well. Really? He's the organist of Gloucester Cathedral in England. Well, here it is.
So and that's the organ in all of its sort of full glory. We were just listening to Sir William Walton's Coronation March, and it was played by David Briggs, and he was using the organ that lives in Los Angeles at the Congregational Church. And you were rolling your eyes around. My guest is Joe Payne. It's, it's, it's a huge instrument, um, and it's of the English cathedral type, played by David Briggs, of course, who's one of the spectacular English cathedral organists. Let's go to what makes a French organ um, sound French. Well, it's the acoustic again, isn't it? It's that, that marvelous space, um, as well as the extremely large instruments, which the organs of, of Notre Dame and saint sulpice all the great Parisian churches. Foray, and Saint-Saëns. Uh, that, whole, that whole, and of course, all the French, the great French composers were organists. That's right. Uh, for, and they all made their livings and as And your organists. important point, was there a, a French genius organ inventor? There must have been a man who uh, invented better instruments there at this were. point. I mean, there were great geniuses of building in every country. And I think in, in France, it would have to be that great genius of the latter part of the 19th century who built all the great Parisian organs, uh, a man by the name of Aristide Cavalier Colle. Oh. And he built all the big instruments that one normally associates with these very, very large acoustical palaces, so yeah, to speak. Because it's sort of, you think of the um, Eiffel Tower or the Crystal Palace and the, you know, the, the great steam engines, the locomotives that the British were working up and this, this kind of sound. Well, the, this kind of, of sound and this size of instrument, of course, owes itself, its development to the invention of electricity. Well, let's go to Louis Vierne. This is a prelude played by another colleague of yours, Michael Murray. And the cathedral's not in France, but it's close enough. It's at the St. John the Divine in New York City.
So we were just listening to Louis Vierne. It was a prelude played by Michael Murray. What I love about the end of the chords, Joe, is the way the organ pulsates. You know, <laughs> you can just sort of hear it like a rhinoceros coming to a grinding halt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you were talking um, about the French inventing bigger organs and sort of better music and the whole thing becomes larger and larger. And was it a French composer like Poulenc who had the idea of putting an organ with a symphony? Mm, no, that actually is something that, that goes way back in, in its history. But I think the the music of, of Poulenc and uh, and Louis Vierne and this whole several generations of French composers, of course, uh, wrote big colossal music. You know, for instance, Vierne's music for the anniversary of the death of Napoleon. And, you know, it was just absolutely loud, colossal music, which takes full orchestras. And it was and only happening and, there, not in England? Well, it happened there, too. Wherever you had large, huge spaces, and it's when these most of the the great cathedrals in, in, in Paris, for instance, are basically 19th century affairs, uh, the big churches, that is. To fill them up. They to had fill to... them up with the music. They had to have big, huge organs, mm-hmm. and and they got larger and larger and larger, and the invention of uh, of the consoles, putting the console in somewhere several hundreds of feet away from its pipes uh, was possible because of the invention of electricity. Remote control. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's listen to just a little bit of Poulenc so we can get that flavor of what happens when you put an organ with symphony. So we were just sampling a little bit of the Poulenc Concerto for Organ and Timpani, and that was played by Marie-Claire Alain with the Orchestre Nationale of France with Jean Martinon as a conductor. And now we're going to sample something <laughs> that's far from your dear little country churches. Here's Strike Up the Band with all of its bells and whistles. We're laughing. It sounds like we're at the circus there with that organ. Well, this is this is a very important facet of the history of the organ. Uh, its use in the movie palaces and and in the circus also. Uh, the Calliope or the is is a very close cousin of the 
mighty pipe organs that Bach played. It makes me smile. It makes me think of having a good time. And we were just remarking that when you hear the organ, it's very pictorial. I mean, if you hear a violin, you think, that's beautiful, and you imagine the person playing the violin. But the organ, and why is that? It seems to evoke images always, and I think it's part of the the fact that it was used that way for so long. I mean, uh, you know, whether it was in the, the great movie palaces of the silent film era or um, radio programs in the 30s and 40s. Um, where you My had, wife, uh, Bill. Yes, and the, the creeping Hammond organ music in the background. I mean, it's an instrument that was used to evoke certain images and certain moods. And this, I think, has had its good as well as a bad effect on, on the way we perceive the instrument. The organ will forever evoke images of funerals or weddings, if you will. Uh, not that. <laughs> no, certainly not. I'll um, play that at your funeral, Joe. Well, all right. <laughs> 40 years from now. <laughs> We've been having a little trip, and I hope it's been fun for you. What makes an organ an organ? And my guest is Joseph Payne. Thank you so much, Joe, for coming Thank in. Thank you, Virginia. Our engineer today has been Antonio Oliart ross The producer is Alan McClellan. I'm Virginia Eskin. A note to you is made possible by the Friends and Alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio Boston. Boston.